First Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. In the name of Jesus. Oh, I want to say something around there. The Bible says that if any man teach otherwise, okay, and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Next verse. He is what? Proud. Knowing nothing. But doting about questions and stripes of words. Whereof cometh envy and strife and railings and evil summer things. <laughs> Some people don't know the word summer things. I will leave you to your dictionary. Uh huh. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw yourself. But godliness with contentment is gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry out nothing. Say amen. Say amen. After sharing those words, he goes down to the 20th verse of the same chapter. And he says, Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely called so, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. He told him, Grace be with thee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want to entreat you as a father to a child, okay? Of course, some of you, I'm not, you don't see me as father, but I want to entreat some of you as a father too. A child. Praise the Lord. I want to entreat you as, as a what? A father too. A child. Those, those words don't work when I'm talking to you as a brother in the Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you need to fellowship in a certain understanding from why I speak these things. And if you have not fellowship from therein, you might not appreciate the experience from where I come from. Say amen. Now, I want to speak to you as a spiritual father to some of you. Huh? And I don't want to speak to you as a brother. So if, if you understand, because there are certain things that you might not understand in brotherly understanding. Eh? You get my point? Do you understand what I mean? You, you might say, you are my brother in the Lord. I appreciate our brotherhood, okay? But now I want to speak to some of you as a father in the spirit. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, there are many things that look so the same in the gospel and the church. But by reason of their thoughts, draw difference. You get my point? When we all sing songs in church, we all sound like we are singing the same song. When we are preaching the gospel in church, we all seem like we are preaching the same gospel. When we sit on those chairs, wherever we are, we all seem like by reason of sitting next to so and so, it means that we relates to a certain place of 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 understanding. But there are things in God that make us different individually. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. But even though we are different in these things, we ought not to be indifferent in our difference. And that is the place where the gospel speaks of something called the unity of faith. The unity of faith is what defines our oneness in God deeper than the elitism of opinions and ideas pertaining to the same God. I mean to say that I might read Luke chapter 3 and understand it differently from the way you understood it. You get my point? But if we are in the unity of the faith, 
and we both not understood the same scriptures, the same scripture, okay? There is something that still binds us in God, deeper than what I understood or what you did not understand. And thereby, we don't have strife, we don't have contentions, we don't have amassing, we don't have thrivings to and fro, we don't have despisings, we don't have places of fighting each other in the gospel, even though we might not all agree. Because, again, I tell you, when we read these scriptures, everybody interprets them the way they find. Hallelujah. The place of the unity of the faith is the place where the pillars of the gospel are imminent in the spirits of all of us. That even though we might become indifferent on a few loose ends of the gospel, we still maintain a certain center of understanding, a certain center of appreciation in the things of God. Hallelujah. Unity of the faith is not necessarily a place where there are no diversions of opinions according to the same scripture. No. Because the beauty of the diversion sometimes, if they're in the right spirit and source, you realize that those are the distinctions that make the word of God broad because they bring many facets of the word of God to us. And thereby, the true distinctions of fellowship. We have one verse to preach in the Feast of Generals, and Pastor Zach preaches it in a certain dimension. I preach it in another dimension. Pastor Isaiah preaches it in another dimension. Pastor Nixon preaches it in another dimension. But in the end of the time, when everybody's hearing, there is no contention. There is no dispute. There is no strife in between us. There is no place where one will say, but if Apostle Grace says this and Pastor Zach says this, who is right? And depending on your inclination, I think I'm biased with this guy because when he's ministering to me, he just quite doesn't seem to catch what, what the other one is catching. And then the place of comparing ourselves in the gospel. When those strife and contentions, corrupt minds of disputing people pervade us as a ministry or as a church or as Christians individually, we become indifferent to the mind that God had when he knew that we all have a certain part in the body. But most importantly, then we get to the place where we must learn to appreciate why we had to be in the same ministry, why we had to carry a certain unity of the faith, why we had to understand things the same way. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. The, when you read the scriptures about those men, you realize that Paul tells you from there are certain people in the scriptures that you have to withdraw from. That's a very hard thing. But there are certain people from in the scriptures, like I just read for you, that you just have to withdraw from. Withdraw. Just withdraw. Don't pray for them. Withdraw. Don't teach them. Withdraw. Don't try to correct them. Withdraw. Nice to ask. But if the grace of God is available to teach men which are ignorant, how be that there are places in God where God says, these ones, you pull away. Don't try to explain to him. Don't try to interpret to him this way. Because there are certain people, for even from the time we started fellowship, or you start fellowship with them, they are already on another plane. And until you all get on the same plane, you can't put these elitisms of ideas I mentioned about on the table to debate. Because when you put them on the table, they will be fighting each other. They will not be complimenting each other. You understand what I mean? Sometimes we move in a love that is ignorant. Because some of us understand one-dimensional love. And then you hear a man like Paul handing over some to torment of their flesh that they might be saved of their spirit. He, he, he said, we handed some over to the devil for torment. You might say, he, Paul, did not love. No, 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 no. Try to understand Paul. This was not a man walking out of love. This was a man who was seeing another man's spirit getting wasted. And he depends, de debates on, is he, is, he, is he restorable or he's not restorable? And depending on the basis they are on, he says, this one is not restorable. I'd rather hand him over and he gets a sickness. And then he dies quicker before he corrupts himself that we might save his spirit on that day. But no judgment as such can come on a man if you have not seen the end of those men's lives. Some people don't even know where certain people are going next year, and they're also handing them over to the devil. Do you understand? 
When we go into salvation, you can be normal a Christian. But a time comes when you stop being normal. You can be compromising as a Christian. You can even play around whichever way you want to. Pray when you want, attend service when you want, fast when you want, pray when you want. But there comes a time where you stop all that nonsense and say, you know what? When I was a child, I spoke as a child, understood as a child, and thought as a child. But when I grew up, I threw away childish things. There's a point in God where you learn to throw away childish things, and then you go into the deep things of God. When you start to enter those deep things of God, there is a place in God that makes you more accountable for the time that you have on earth. When I mean time that you have on earth, I mean every second starting to count in the things of God. Hallelujah. Now when Paul tells you, for example, that I am not accountable for any man's blood, why does Paul make that kind of, of bold statement? Where does he get from to say that I take your record to this day that I'm pure of the blood of all men? Why does he say I'm not accountable of anyone's blood? Let's read the next line. The next line says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. That means it's the whole counsel of God is not revealed through Paul, he is accountable of certain men's blood. That means that men's blood is against our responsibility and due accountability to God to make sure that we give you the all counsel of God. Now, if you're a worshiper, for example, you might not stand on this pulpit to preach, but what is coming out of you, voice and sound, for those of you who attended the overnight yesterday, but the voice that is reverberating out of your spirit, the sound of the spirit coming out of you must entirely be a part in you that contributes every other day to the distribution of the counsels of God to the spirits of men and thus called ministry. Because there's a place where worship goes past the nice voice that you sing to the place that ministers to the inner part of a man in places and dispensations that no man could ever. So because we are dealing with the counsel of God, primarily I must carry the whole counsel of God in my spirit before I think to deliver the same. Because God is not judging me according to what I think is the whole counsel of God. No, he's judging me according to what he knows is the whole counsel of God. And therefore, when you start to deal with such matters, even the way you judge matters starts to become different. Some of you are too quick to judge men of God. You're too quick to judge your spiritual authority. Because you don't know the responsibility they have over your life. And what they owe to God. You don't, you're quick to judge other Christians. You're quick to judge your fellow brethren and sisters. Why? Because you see, when we are dealing with the counsel of God, we are talking about the mind of God in its own entirety. That a man does not walk this life of salvation discovering a newer part of God, but rather enjoying the oldest part of God that is inside their spirit. The reason of that precise and complete knowledge of God. That is why he gave you epignosis. He gave you epignosis that you... You would minister, he would minister confirmations to the already affirmed experiences of the new creature in you. God does not intend to affirm again what ought to be confirmed in you because he expects that the positioning that you carry in him is enough to affirm. Hallelujah. That is why when you get to the place of the Holy Spirit, he says that the Spirit of God beareth witness with my spirit, that I speak truth. You realize that in this instance, the spirit of God was confirming the affirmation in Paul. And the affirmation in Paul had a distinction of the counsel of God entirely given unto us because the Bible speaks as of us which are the stewards of the mystery. He has given unto us the entirety of his counsel inside us. The Bible says he has made known unto us the mystery of his will. 
So when he says that he has made known unto us the mystery of his will, it is not a place of present continuous, progressively adopting to the mystery of his will. We don't just learn the mystery of his will. He has given unto us. He has revealed it unto us. He has fully accorded unto us the mystery of his will. He has made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. That means it was a deliberate mind in God to enter your spirit and put in you a hundred percent the mystery of his will, the secret of his will. So when you're ministering, you're not ministering seeking the will, you're ministering with a whole understanding of the very will. And because you are working in that dimension, the counsel of God is a hundred percent revealed to you. When you're ministering from the place where the counsel of God is 100% revealed unto you, you realize that the days that you have on your life are equal to what God has revealed to you. You don't get it. The days that you have on your life are equal to what God has revealed to you. Why do you think he says they die because they lack knowledge? He means to say, the councils were cut short. That's how far they knew. Now, I'm not talking of life body here. I'm talking of life in the spirit, being alive unto God. You know why I speak these things? Because you see now, the church has grown. There's a place where we can't hold you anymore in biscuit. So you, start, you have to now start to bear hard things. So some of you, if you have followed the things I've been preaching for these past two weeks, unfortunately, some of you attend, some of you don't. But if you follow this, this particularly April, the Lord has been speaking to me about certain things that I'm trying to pass on to you, some of you, because something is about to happen about August. And if it doesn't find you ready, I don't know. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. August is going to separate many people, by the way. And I speak as a man of God. The people you see here, and they look so potential, but in a few weeks you're going to be surprised that the people which didn't look potential were actually potential. There are people God is going to raise in these months that they are going to cause many to become jealous. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. They are going to cause many to what? To become jealous. Why? Because you see, whether we want to slow down our processes or we want to fasten them, God is serious. But some Christian you might never explain to. Because they don't even have the simplicity of the back end of what is God saying. So if you see somebody there has been touched and somebody there has been touched and the word says that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Do you realize that now I'm speaking from the established thing? So August is established by God. It is not something I'm speaking of as of whether we wait for it to be or not. No. Everything spoken that is established has the witnesses. Hallelujah. Praise the good Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus. So I'm saying that some people, to the degree of how much counsel is given unto you, equals to the life that you're going to have in this world. And I'm not talking of the life body. No. I'm talking of the life eternal. That is why the revelation the Lord places on David can transcend his age and still minister to you in 2015. Because the counsel of God revealed to David is older than any ages to come. Now, that is why a musician can have a song and sing a very nice song and have a nice CD. And that CD is sung for two weeks, one month, and we don't know even why it is. Because the longevity of the of, 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 of that CD resonating to the lives of men to truly minister equals to how much counsel is revealed to them while they minister. Because there are things in God that go deeper than the words we sing or we preach to you. How am I sure that in 20 years to come this gospel will be necessary? Praise the Lord Jesus. I preached a seven in summer in 2010. Up to now, it's moving. You get it? Up to now, some people don't even know that it was preached in 2010. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to live longer in the gospel than even my body can allow. You get it? Now, as a father to you, 
There are things I can commit to you and tell you that there is something that happened to me years ago when I was with the Lord. And that thing defines a certain way I understand God. It defined a certain way I understand God. You might never predict me fully. Oh, let me say, you will never predict Apostle Grace fully. Because if some of you just one time came behind that curtain to see from where I drank from, you realize that many of you are too far from even the knowledge that that place exists. I mean, if you're still telling Christians, listen to the sermon. And then somebody spends one and a half years in the gospel and you ask them, how many sermons of Apostle Grace have you listened to? And they give you a number that is very disappointing. Why? Because it's not as important to them. And you're not going to push it onto them because you don't want to seem like you are forcing them to. And then somebody comes in the ministry and spends three months and they listen to everything. Why won't I ride with that one? And teach them more. Because they're hungry. I see a spirit in me, which is also in them also. Because for some of you who should understand, the things we teach you, we also took time to sit before God to teach us. There's a price. That is why I don't get understand when people say, I'm submitted to Apostle Grace. And then I don't see in meetings often. Oh, I don't, I, there's a certain language that doesn't come out of you. Oh, there's a certain thing that is not manifesting in you. I fail to understand how to minister to you. Not because I don't want to minister to you, but because there's a certain way you ought to be feeling about the things of God. You ought to be feeling a certain way. If Pastor Zach is here on Saturday, and he's here on Sunday, and he's there on Monday, and he's there on Apostle, and sometimes he comes to Shambhu, and Pastor Nixon comes, and Apostle Emma comes, do you know any more than them? So, what comes to your spirit when you see men their caliber seated in front of a person listening? Don't you think they have enough to run their own churches? More than enough to run their own churches? More, more than enough? If you compare them with many people who are preaching across the world. They have more than enough to run their own ministry. And well agreeably so. But why do they dedicate their time to sit in the presence of God and say, let me go and learn? Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Why would somebody commit their time to go and say, God, uh, this is my time with you? Listen, if, if, if your spirit authority, for example, tells you, listen to all my sermons, I mean listen to them. That is why the Lord has been speaking to me so strongly, so strongly, that the next condition I'm going to put, if you're submitted to Apostle Grace, you're going to tell me all the sermons I've preached, and you're going to listen to all of them. And I'll give you a time frame in a time to come. If they are too hard for you, I'll release you. And I'm very serious. A hundred percent. I'm not joking. Because I realize you're wasting time. You know, it's not important to be a father of many. No. It's important to get 12 men and teach them how they can change the world. They can change the world. There were thousands that that walked with the Lord. And there are thousands that will walk with us. Trust me. You look at Panero. Thousands. Now we are hitting two to the three thousand. Thousands will come in our lives. But those thousands will come. I pray among all things that some of you don't be among the number. You just don't be among the number. You be something in the ministry. You be something in the ministry. You be a force worth recording for. You, you be something that people can look at and say, no, no. This is more than just a church attendance. There's something in her. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? But sometimes you don't expect the place where oil is going to come out of an olive if it's not fresh. And now we've gone into a place where we have to press you. But now we've had to get to that place where we don't need the age anymore. That's why now I'm drawing lists of people who say, me, me the Lord told me to submit. I write names now. Individually. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Because they realize we can boast in a place of affiliation and lose the picture of accountability. Even if you're a papa, even if you're a mama, even if Simania you're a man of God, Simania pastor who go to those things and listen to them, there's a reason why they are there. They carry certain answers. 
You know, the Lord revealed to me a time where we are going to be too busy to even sit and listen to one sermon. We're going to be too busy. But if we're going, it's going to take us too much to sit under a sermon. Some of us. That we'll have to force ourselves to. Do you understand what I mean? But while we're in that position, we have to become a bit more serious about our salvation. We have to be. We have to be. We have to be. Some of you don't know that your life, your life, is in the testament. It is in the testament. The total number of life that you will live in the spirit or function on the earth equals to how much counsel is revealed unto you. Is revealed unto you. That is why certain men live forever. They live forever because the things that come out of their spirit transcend any time frame. Whether it's 60 years to come, those things will be relevant to any man of the Spirit. Whether it's 200 years to come, those words will be relevant to any man of the Spirit. Whether it's a thousand years to come, those words will be relevant to that man of the Spirit. But now I've gotten to a point where now my burden now sometimes is not just to teach men these things. It is just to introduce to them a certain place in God from where they, want, they should they should be digging out these things. But why should they dig out what is already available in the sermon? They are wasting their own time. There are men now who are 45 and their ministries have ended. But they are in ministry and they are preaching and they are teaching but their ministries have ended. They can't minister to certain men anymore. Even their own, they are not ministering. But they are 45. I went to university with people I know, and some of you also can testify this. There were guys who were very hot on God. But you meet them right now, and they are 30, they are 60, they are, they are 32, they are 14, 29, 28. And the brooks dried. You just hear stories of, oh, he was a papa, she was in choir, she was a worshiper, he was an intercessor, but something in them died. They are alive, but they are not alive. Because something in them died. The Christian faith today, if you look at the ministries around, do you know there are people who are dead? They are in churches, but they are dead. They are there every Sunday. They, they show faith because they want to go to heaven. But they are dead. They are dead. They shout and scream and jump up. Woo! We are the dancing generation. They're just the dancing generation. They're just dancing. You understand? They're dancing. But that's it. They are dead. They're dead. They're Christians who are really what? Dead. Dead. A hundred percent dead. Not in God. No. They are dead from the things of God. They are dead. They are there, but they are dead. They are there. They, they are in church. They are look, they, they, you, they, you look at the person and you are sure they are Christian. They love the gospel. They attend Panero. But when you, ask, you assess their life, they are really dead men. The brooks are dried. There is nothing inside them. Nothing. They have a form of godliness, but there is nothing inside them. Some people you look at and they get excited, they raise hands, they even cry, scream. But when you examine them, there is nothing in them. Nothing. 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 There are no more men. There are places of fellowship and no more. There are places of prayer and no more. There are places of interpretation and no more. There are places of intercession and no more. Everything about them is no more. And they are comfortable. And to show you they are dead, they don't feel the urge to be alive. Because no dead man can want to be alive. They don't feel it. It's not in them. You might push them 
and do everything you want to, you will not. Let me tell you. Let me tell you something. Be anything in this world. But never be dead to God. Never be dead to God. Never. 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 And the quickest way to is to stir from his presence. And I'm not talking of presence, just presence. I'm talking about the tangible presence of God. I told people, let me tell you something. If a man is ministering from a gift, there are limitations to every gift. Because the highest level of ministration in God is love. That is why he says that where they be prophecies, they will cease. He says whether they be knowledge, it shall also vanish away. But he says, but love never ends. It never fails. It never fails. When a man goes past what you think you know, and past what you think you can speak, and past what you think is a gift on you, you realize that a man ministering from the degree of knowledge and gifts upon their lives is different from a man ministering from the degree and distinction of relationship that they carry from God. When you learn to minister in the dispensation of the relationship that you share from God, that the total sum of the life that I share with God is out of that that I draw to stand before men to minister, you realize that you minister far beyond any gift can. You minister far beyond any gift can. Because there are places in God the gift cannot break through. There are places in God knowledge cannot break through. Even men who say, yeah, I know. There are places in God where knowledge ceases. And at that particular point, there's a certain love that faileth not. And when that love that faileth not <laughs> comes in the man's life, you realize that there is something about them that just can't fail to change anything. Because they're not subject to the gift and its distribution as of how much God distributes according to his choice to distribute. It's entirely the fullness of the love of God working in them. When you carry the fullness of love of, of the love of God working in you, there is a certain way you learn to respond contrary to the world and contrary to things and contrary to many people and contrary to many let me tell you this soon i want to preach something on 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 the things that are secret in god because many of us have practiced so long what men see that you get on the pulpit and sing too loud and people say this sister sing you get on the pulpit and pray and people say ah this sister prays then you get on the pulpit and preach and they say, ah, oh, this brother preaches. And then you get on the pulpit and do this and say, oh, this guy of God does this. But you see, and the, when, when the Bible says, and the Lord that sees you doing secret, he shall reward you openly. There are men, are you hearing me? Who do openly to be rewarded openly. And there are men who do in secret to be rewarded openly. These two men are different. Why? Because if, um, if, if you are the first man which does openly, to be rewarded openly, there is a place and disclosure in God that the fact that you thought to do openly, what men ought to reward you openly, in its own self, you've received your full reward. And therefore, that man's full reward is that he got on a pulpit. Her full reward is that she did a good concert. His full reward is that he had a very big crusade. His full reward is that he did a very nice Sunday service. That's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. But it's very, very, very mature. Because when that man leaves that pulpit, you realize that after that pulpit, there is something that doesn't follow them. There's just something that doesn't follow them. There's just something that doesn't follow them. But when the Bible says, and number two, before I even go there, those men won't stay because they do two things at a go. 
they seek a place of ministering to people openly while they seek the reward of the saints. Now let me show you the true blessing. When the Bible says that he that does in secret will be rewarded openly, when a man is in that dispensation, every time he stands on the pulpit, eh, every time he stands on that pulpit to say, now I am standing there. He's standing there on the basis of the things God is going to start to reward him. You understand? Here, we're not, we're not, talking, about, we're not talking about the satisfaction that I sat on a big pulpit or that I attracted many people. No. We're talking of the satisfaction of what is our true reward. Because many Christians don't even understand what is the true reward in God. What is our true reward in God? What are those things the scriptures define as treasures in heaven where moths cannot get to? What are those things that approve us in God way deeper than the gift that excels in our lives every other day by reason of yielding to it? And that's when I realized that some people really don't know true reward in God. They don't know true reward in God. Now, on the day of judgment, when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, they don't understand that that place of good and faithful, the place of faithfulness toward God, is not that I was here every Saturday teaching you. The place of faithfulness toward God is the things that I learned to do in secret. Our ministry toward men is supposed to present us before men reward. You get my point? We are a reward to them. They are a reward to us. Men ultimately become the ultimate reward. Not the money and the cars. No, those ones follow the anointing on your life. When you start to win men over, when you start to win men, I'm not talking of exciting men. I'm not talking of giving men answers. I'm talking of winning men over. That a man will listen to you and want to go back and read the Bible. And want to go back and seek God. And want to go back and fast. And want to go back and pray. Let me tell you, there are impressions that you can't create in certain men until you learn the secret place. When you learn ministry in the secret place and you stand before men. Listen, there are people who can preach anything and get you slain and scream, but they'll never move you to seek God. They'll never create a certain anger, hunger, sorry, in your spirit and thirst ultimately and a place of admiring the things of the spirit. Because when they stand on that pulpit, they seek hey, to be rewarded than to reward. That's why Paul looks at the church, he says, for you are my true reward. He looks at men and he says, for you are my true reward. The seal of my apostleship. You get my point? You are my true reward. That means the true joy that we carry in God is the things that start to happen before our very own eyes in the lives of men who are sitting under us. That is true reward. And that cannot be put on the pulpit by gift. That can only be done in a secret place, entirely in the ministration of love. You see, that's why they only see one facet of Paul in the letters writing to men. But they know not how sometimes in the places of his travailing in the spirit, you read things in Galatians 4:19, my spiritual children, for whom I labor for like a woman in bad tongues until Christ be formed in you. They don't read the places where he is in much tears for the sake of the church. And that is why there are people who can't really have tears for the gospel. They can't really have pain for people. Their excitement is just to stand on this pulpit and sing a nice song and go back slain, oh happy that she sang. But do they really go back in the secret place to really examine the things that are in the mind of God pertaining the lives of certain people and therewith carry the ultimate burden, which now comes as a message before men. Men read message, but inside you, they realize that there is a true burden. 
Because love is not when I tell you I love you. No. Love is when I have to share out my heart every other day. In all its all simplicity, whether I slept hungry or not, do you know? Whether I had lunch or I didn't, do you care? Whether I, I slept out or not, do you even want to know? No. But the most important thing is that I have availed myself every other day with all passion to minister to you, not seeking your own. No. No, you're not seeking your own. But like Paul says, but seeking the fruit that will abound to your account. Because when a man is patterned, like we're sharing yesterday on, on radio, when a man is patterned, he doesn't need your seed. He doesn't need your attendance. I don't need you individually to attend for me to have service. If you don't attend, God will bring another person and they attend. And he has done it over the years. You look. You realize that there are people who left the ministry and more people came in. And so the Bible says, they walk out to let others come in. Because the center of our real life is not entirely based on certain men. It's a hundred percent God. Our expectation is from the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll continue from there. Some next time, I don't know when. I realize that I've said too much for some of you. Praise the Lord. And if I continue past this point, I might lose you. Or you might lose me. Praise the Lord. Just raise your hands and speak to Jesus Christ. Your eye is on the sparrow. And your hand, he comforts me from the end of the earth to the day of my heart. And to mercy and grace is peace. You call me. Your purpose, I say, your best for your glory. May you draw me as your love and grace demand. And I will Oh. 
I got no boundaries and limitations. God, Lord, has deeper. Lord, has deeper. Blood has God. Feet has God. Back has God. So has God. So has God. Until we are no more.
highest praise. She's the grand I am. She's the beginning of the end. She's the alpha and the omega. She's the present and the future. She's the king's man redeemer. She's the rose of sorrow. She's the grand I am. I got it, what? 
Thank you, Lord. 